All right, Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 1 now. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was also no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Father, we're trusting for your anointing and liberty this morning. Let me preach it the way I feel it, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What I just read to you was the end. God has a plan. I could, won't start taking time to read, but you know how it starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was not form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep. Now, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When God created the heavens and the earth, God had a plan. And the plan is culminated in Revelation 21. And I, John, I saw the new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. God's plan was that he would develop on earth a people that would be his people and that he would rule and reign with them. He would wipe every tear from their eyes. He would heal. There would be no more death, nor dying, nor sorrow, nor crying, any of those things. That was the plan from the very beginning. So I want to turn, I want you to turn with me now to John chapter 5. Verse 17. John 5, 17. Many of you will be familiar with it. John 5, 17. You can type it in real fast into your, because this is an important verse to understand. John 5, 17. Jesus answered them, says, my father has been working until now. And I have been working. Now they sought to kill him, the next verse says, because he called his father and him as one. And therefore, uh, he made himself one with God. But the issue is not his oneness with God, although the, the, obviously it's an important doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the faith. But the issue is, is that he's working. So we sing it, even though I can't see it, he's working. Even though I can't feel him, he's working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even though I can't see you, you're working. Even though I can't feel you, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop, you never stop, you never stop working. You see, Jesus said, my father's working and I'm working. It's happening now. But what's working? I want to speak to you this morning about the work of God from two perspectives, the universal perspective and the individual perspective. Because God is working on a universal basis. Now go with now in your mind with me through the scripture, and I won't take the time to go to turn in your Bible. But if you will remember the scriptures with me, remember that God planted a garden because he was working. And he put Adam in the middle of the garden. Why? Because he was working. And he made Eve. Why? Because he was working. Then he put a tree in the middle of the garden. garden the tree of good knowledge of good and evil said, don't eat of it. Why? Because he's working. And so they ate of it. And then God comes in the garden. And you know, you know the story. What have you done? And the woman she gave me. And the serpent. And, then, and God's saying, I'm working. And he says to the serpent, you know Genesis 3.15, which is called the evangel, proto, I forget the word. It's, it's the first prophetic word of the, of the gospel, of, the, of evangelism. Which is, I will put enmity between your seed, talking to the serpent, and the seed of the woman. He will bruise, you will crush his hand, bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. So God is working. This working that is working is working on this, this whole thing that, is, that he's doing, that he's going to eradicate all rebellion. 
He's going to eradicate all lies that has come from the liar that is introduced in the third chapter of Genesis. The liar is introduced in third Genesis 3. Rebellion, the rebellious one, is introduced in Genesis 3. And although you may not understand, in that introduction you get no backstory, but once you meet this serpent in the tree, you'll understand that what God is doing is the destruction of this serpent. He's going to take all of his authority, take all of his guile, all of his murder, all of his lies, everything. He's going to allow it to begin to operate in the lives of humanity. But as it operates in the lives of humanity, God is working that he might not only destroy it out of the lives of humanity, but he destroyed the very devil himself. That the devil himself will be destroyed. The devil himself will be locked up. This is the whole plan that's been going on for the last 6,000 years with humanity. So when you look and you watch the story, God goes along and just out of nowhere, he chooses Abram out of Ur, out of Ur. And he comes along to Abram and says, walk before me and be perfect. And I will make a great nation out of you. And in your nation, all the, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And as you're reading the story, what you're, not, what you're understanding is that everything that's happening is happening from a heavenly perspective that God is working. Now, we get caught in the earthly perspective, but the heavenly perspective is God is working. So God looks at mankind, and mankind's violent and wicked, and so he goes to Noah and says, Build an ark, you found grace in my sight. Build an ark, for I'm going to preserve your... And from earth's perspective, we look and say, Oh, Noah's building an ark, and everybody on from heaven's perspective, God is working. Every step, every generation, every individual, every family, God is is working. So you can go through the scripture and see that Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and I thought Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, God is working. So Joseph has some dreams and he doesn't have any idea about these dreams. These the, the sun, moon, and stars are going to bow down to me. The, this, the, the things of wind are going to bow down to me and I'm going to be a ruler and the next thing you know he's sold into a pit and then he's sold into print then he's then he's sold to, uh, to Potiphar's home and becomes a servant. Then he's lied about and he goes into prison. And De Joseph comes to the end and says, I don't get everything that God is doing, but here's what I do understand. You meant it to me for evil, but God was working behind the scenes the whole time. God meant it toward me for good. So even though you may have meant it on a micro level, you may have meant it to evil, God on a macro level was meaning it for my good. And on top of that, Joseph then is going to become the vice president of Egypt. Joseph is going to, going to begin to save up all of the wheat so that Jacob and his family can be, be preserved. And Jacob and his family come to Egypt. And you say Jacob and then them came to Egypt because there was a famine. Yes, they came to Egypt because there was a famine. But the whole idea behind that was God was working. And so God was working in the famine. The whole famine, the purpose of the famine was to get Jacob to Egypt. So God was working in the famine. So on the micro level, you go, oh, God, what's going on? God, what's going on? But on the macro level, you look and you realize, I'm sorry, I got that block for you guys. Now on the macro level, you look and realize that God was working through the famine even when Jacob was going into Egypt. Jacob goes into Egypt, and then the sons begin, and then he passes away. But then they become servant slaves in Egypt. And you say, oh, man, what's going on? This is so terrible. God knew that because he told Abraham back in Genesis 17, your people will serve, will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. So God already knew. You say, well, if God only knew, already knew, how come he allowed it to happen? Because God is working. Even though I can't see it, he's working. Even though I can't feel it, he's working. You never stop. You never stop working. He's always working. Working, so you watch and you see that God is working, and God is working, and you can watch when Moses comes along, and Moses goes, and he's he's preserved supernaturally. He should have been killed, but we see that he's preserved supernaturally. How did Moses get preserved supernaturally? Because God was at work, and so Moses is raised in the house of Pharaoh. Is it by accident? No, God is working. Moses killed somebody. You say, oh, you messed up the plan of God. Moses didn't mess up the plan of God when he murdered somebody. God turns around and says, it's not a problem. I'm still working. So Moses finds himself out in the wilderness watching sheep, singing songs like, I'm so tired and so weak. 
But I must be traveling on. There will be peace. In There's a bush. What is that? Well, I've seen a lot of burning bushes, but the problem is this bush kept burning through the second two verses of the song. And it's still, I will turn aside now and see why this bush is burning. And the scripture says, when Moses turned aside to see the burning bush, God spoke out of the bush. Why? Even when I can't see it, he's working. Even when I can't feel it, he's working. You never stop, never stop. You see, Moses thought it was all over with. He had missed his calling, missed his purpose, but he had no idea that it was right in the middle of God's time clock. And so he knew, so God had a perfect time to reveal himself to Moses. And he says to Moses, you got to go deliver the people. And Moses is like, I'm not qualified. And whenever you run into God, the first thing you have, the first feeling you get is disqualification, lack of qualif qualification. You're the, if you feel like you're not qualified, that's what makes you qualified. It's the ones who come up and say, I can do it, or the ones who have to be retrained. But the ones who say, I can't do it, God says, you're good material. If you'll lean on me, I'll make something out of you. So God does this with Moses, and he goes, let my people go, and the plagues, and the Passover, and the Red Sea, and the whole time God is working, and he takes them into the wilderness, and that catches them by surprise. We're out here, you know, we didn't have a good exit strategy from Egypt. We didn't really think about, you know, what are we going to do when we get out of here? We were just so excited about getting out, we didn't think about coming in. So now we're caught between getting out and coming in. And I don't know what to do, and I'm fearful. And the children of Israel are like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, here's my word for you. Even though you can't see it, he's working. Even though you can't feel it, he's working. He never stopped. He never stopped working. So he's able to cause manna to start to appear, and the people are provided for. And God goes before them, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, to lead them and to lead them and to put before them their potential. And God, Moses, sends out the 12 spies. And the 12 spies go out and look at the land of promise. And they come back. Ten of them come back. And the only thing they could see were the problems. The giants are so large. We're never going to be able to do it. God gets angry. Joshua and Caleb have a different attitude and a different spirit. And they say, we're well able to do it. We can over. We can do it. But, but the ten spies caused the congregation to get fearful. And when the congregation got afraid, then God says, that's it, Moses. I'm not taking this congregation into the promise. They're going to die in the wilderness. So for the next 40 years, Moses is back to singing. I'm so tired and so weary. So why are you traveling around in the wilderness, Moses? <laughs> I'm waiting for this group to die. i got to feed them. I gotta serve them, but I gotta wait on them to die because God says these aren't going in. You see those young kids, the ones that weren't standing up and singing to begin with? That's the generation I'm gonna bring in. So that everybody says the children who couldn't face the giants, they're gonna be the very ones that come in and take the land. Yes. We're gonna be the very ones. I'll take the very ones that you looked at and looked down your nose at, said they'll never, never be anything. And because you can't see it, he's working. And even though you can't feel it, he's still working. So he never stops. He never stops working. And you don't know what God just did this morning in the hearts and lives of some of those children as I have raised their hands and sing some songs. You don't know that God won't take those songs and bring them back in the night hour. You don't know that God will begin to speak into their lives out of the words that we made come out of their mouth, out of their mouths. You see, he never stops. He never stops working. God never stops. He never stops working. So you can read story after story after story. And every time as you read the scripture, you've got to look not only at the micro level of what's happening on, happening on an earthly basis, but you always have to have a heavenly perspective of what's happening from a heavenly perspective because God is working. So a woman marries a guy in Bethlehem. And they leave and they go to Moab because of a famine. A famine. A famine. A famine actually per God used in the purpose and the will and his will. Because they ended up in Moab and the son married a woman, one of them married a woman named Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah. And another one named Ruth. And then the husband died. Naomi's husband died. And and the woman Orpah's husband died, and Ruth's husband died, and Naomi says, Oh man. 
my life is so don't call, just call me Naomi, which means suffering, which means bitterness. And as I'm bitter of spirit, life is, has been really bad for me. Life has been really bad for me. I'm just going to go back to my hometown. And, and Orpah and Ruth say, we'll go back with you. And, and Naomi turns us, says, no, don't leave your people. And Orpah goes back and Ruth says, your God will be my God and, and your people will be my people. And I will stay with you. And she says, well, come with me, blessed to the Lord. And you look at it and say, this is a terrible story. That Naomi left her, lost her husband and her sons and went through a famine. But you didn't understand that even though she couldn't see it, he's working. Even though she couldn't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. Why? Because this little girl named Ruth ends up back in the town in Bethlehem. And Ruth goes out and starts to go out and harvest grain in the field. And when she does, she meets the owner of the field. His name is Boaz. And you don't understand that God had a macro plan for Naomi's life. When Naomi didn't understand what was going on in all of the suffering and the turmoil and the pain of her life, God was working out all, all over her life that Naomi was going to have a daughter-in-law that was going to marry Boaz. And Boaz was going to be in the lineage of the Messiah. And Ruth now was going to be in the lineage of the Messiah. And Ruth, who was out picking up playing because who was a Moabite girl is now named in the New Testament as one of the wives of the patriarchs of the faith of the Messiah. This is Ruth. Why? Because even though you can't see it, he's working. Even though you can't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. He's always working. Moment by moment by moment, he's working. You say that you say, what's the depth of the message? I've got one word for you this morning. He never stops working. He never stops working. He never stops. Why? Because when you get into the wilderness like Moses, when you get into famine like Naomi, when you get into trouble and it feels like you messed up so bad that it's never that it's that it's beyond redemption, you don't understand. It's not about you, it's about him. He never stops working, he never stops working, and the eternal plan of the ages. You have no idea what God is doing through your life for all of eternity. You don't know who you're influencing for the kingdom's sake. You don't know who you're blessing for the kingdom's sake. And the enemy will come along and try to steal in the macro and the micro level of your life what's going on. But if you'll get a heavenly perspective, you look back and say, it's not about my life. It's about his kingdom. Because at the end of the book, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. That was the plan. The plan was the new Jerusalem. The plan was the eternal plan of God, not the micro's plan of my individual life and my individual pain. My tears may have contributed to the kingdom's sake. If that's the purpose, then Lord, bring on the tears. I don't like it. I don't want it. I would like to not have it. But if that's the process, Lord, you never stop working. Here am I. Use me. Send me. Fill me, anoint me, cause me to be whatever you cause me to be within the kingdom, whatever level you want me to be. We don't all have to be great evangelists. We can be Christians who are found faithful to our generation. He never stops. He never stops working in Job. Job is sitting there and, of course, he's blessed, rich, influential. One of the greatest, most influential man, men of the East at the time, Job. And when you read Job chapter 1, it's an interesting situation because, because the scripture says the sons of God came and revealed themselves, came before the Lord, and loose Satan came also. And the Lord says, what are you doing? Where'd you come from? He says, what have you been doing? He says, I'll walk to and fro upon the face of the earth. It gives you an indication that this whole issue is about the earth and about Lucifer. That his domain and dominion somehow has been, earth was, was if it was his prison, or some speculate that this was his domain of influence before he fell. Some believe it was his domain of influence after he fell. Whatever, it was his domain. His do That's why he was there in the garden, because he'd been there, he'd been put there. Whether this was a prison sentence or whether it was part of his authority. We, but he comes before God and says, what God says, what are you doing? He says, I've been walking to and through upon the face of the earth. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, well, can't touch Job. He's got a hedge of protection on God. But if you were to dare remove that hedge, he'd curse you to your face. The only reason he's blessing you and honoring you is because he's so blessed. 
See, part of your testing and your trial and your testimony is what you do when you're not so blessed. Because the devil's accusation before God about you is the only time that he serves you or worships you is when everything's going good. And I love it when it's going good, and I do bless him and honor him. But there have some, been there some dark times in my life that are the deep bowels of my spirit. Praise has risen up out of me in the midst of the pain and the turmoil and the confusion. And I know it bubbles out of me like a lava lamp. Praise. I trust you. I will follow you. I will, even though I'm confused, I'm hurt, I'm mad, I got every emotion of the sun, I feel like I fit everything that's going on in me, but something inside of me, out of my spirit, begins to bubble up and says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Give Him praise. This is the sacrifice of our lips. Thanksgiving and praise. It comes out of the turmoil of pain. So Job suffers the loss of his income, the loss of the sheep, the sheep and donkey and camels, the loss of his sons, his children, and then even the loss of his health. His body is covered in both boils. His wife says, curse God and die. He says, you talk like a foolish woman. You talk like a pagan woman. Curse God and die. I've received good at the hand of the Lord. Shall I not receive evil? Naked I came into the world. Naked I will return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I came in naked, I'm leaving naked, and in between, I'm just going to keep praising him. I have actually heard ministers who have made statements like Job didn't understand, or Job spoke out of turn by saying it was God who did it. And I'm going to hurt your feelings. It was God who did it. Amen. God's the one who initiated the whole conversation. The devil told very clearly, said, I can't do it. You won't allow me. So God says, okay, I'll let you. Now, the reason that I bring that to your attention is you do have to understand, even though I can't see it, he's working. Even though I can't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. Even if it's the loss of income, even if it's the loss of health, he never stops. He never stops working. He never stops. He never stops working. See, the Apostle Paul's thrown into prison. He never stops. He never stops working. He's shipwrecked. He never stops. He never stops working. It's hard. It's painful. You're lied about. People misunderstand you. He never stops. He never stops working. I've watched people run to protect their to protect their reputation. <laughs> Your reputation has to be put in the Lord's hands, and you must trust him with it. When you take your reputation and try to protect it, you're running around willy-nilly, scared, and everything else about your reputation. You become the one who's chasing it rather than resting in the finished work. But God's got your back. He never stops working, and your reputation may never be given back to you while on earth but when you get to heaven your reputation will be found out isn't that the one we read on Facebook that did this, this, this and that yeah look at the size of the crown on their head what, what, what is that about oh well God didn't believe Facebook God didn't believe Facebook. You see, God didn't read Facebook. God looked at the book of life. When he looked at the book of life, he said, look, I, I, I've checked out your posts. I saw you praying when nobody else saw you praying. I saw you giving when it hurt. I saw you sacrificing. I saw you praying, loving your neighbor. I saw you following me. I saw you doing that. You see, the Facebook people never saw that because we don't put on Facebook what we do for the king. Because we're not trying to get a reputation on Facebook. I don't care how many likes I get on Facebook. I've got one like I'm interested in. Amen. I want God himself to hit that notification. Amen. I want him to hit it with that little red. So Job then had to suffer 
because for the kingdom's sake, God had to teach him something. And so, so the process of he never stopped working was he was going to go through deep and great suffering. If you read the book of Job, which is a long read, I'll admit, 42 chapters, when you get to the end, you're going to find out that Job got back twice as much as he ever started with. That the end of Job was better than the beginning of Job, but the process was painful. Never stops. One of my favorite stories, I'll let you go with me and read it. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 18. 2 Chronicles chapter 18. I can tell you about it, but I want you to see it because it's one of my favorite stories. 2 Chronicles chapter 18. This is about a prophet called Micaiah. Micaiah the prophet. Well, we got two kings that are getting together. This is Jehoshaphat. He's the king from Judah. Good king. Ahab, king of Israel from the north. Bad king. Jehoshaphat makes an alliance with Ahab, which is going to get him in trouble that I'm not going to deal with today. But he makes an alliance with Ahab. And they're going to go out to war together. So Jehoshaphat says, he's the king from Judah. He says, um, you know, let, what do the prophets say about this war? And the prophets all come along and say, Go forward and be blessed. You're going to be victorious. Go forward and be blessed. You're going to be pro victorious. But but Jehoshaphat says, is there not a prophet of Jehovah, prophet of the Lord? Do we not have a Jehovah prophet around? And Ahab, I can, uh, you know, I can see him power and say, oh, we got one. His name is Micaiah. They don't like him. Why? He never prophesied good about me. He's always, always, always got problems with me. And so... Verse 7, so the king of Israel, that's that's uh, that's Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, the son of Imlah, and Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. And the king of Israel called one of his officers, said, bring Micaiah, the son, quickly. Well, and I'm going to skip for the sake of time down to, down to, uh, so they bring Micaiah in, and when they bring Micaiah in, they say, Micaiah, what's the word from the Lord? And Micaiah says, go prosper. It's going to work. And, Je and Je the king says to him, no, no, tell me what the word of the Lord is. And so Micaiah says this, um, I'm going to be, verse 18, verse 18. Then Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. The Lord said, how? In what way? So he said, I'll go out and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Verse 22. Now therefore look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Well, then they go and smite him and put him in prison and everything else. This is what I love about this story. God says, Ahab has to fall. How am I going to bring about Ahab's fall? Anybody got any ideas? And one came and says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. Now, I know this messes with your head. How can God use a lying spirit? Because he's God. <laughs> he's God. He therefore can use whatever he wants to use. He causes the wrath of man to praise him. He can use the devil as his, as his puppet. And so, he, because he's God. So he says, okay, go, be a lying spirit in their mouth. So they come and they prophesy and, and they lie and Ahab ends up going into battle and Ahab ends up dying, fulfilling the prophecy of the Lord. My point is this, you don't know, understand, or may even like the way God does things, but he never stops, he never stops working. He never stops, he never stops working. Now, what's that got to do with the price of eggs in China for me today? I don't understand, but there has been a pandemic that shut the entire planet down. Do you think for a second that God Almighty, who runs this whole thing, has been caught by surprise? Do you have any idea? I don't know what he's doing. I just know he's working. I can tell you this. 
God is working. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know how he's doing it. I don't know where this virus came from, if it came from a dead bat or if it was made in some factory, whether it was released by accident or in purpose. I've read every kind of conspiracy theory under the sun, but that's on the micro level. On the macro level, I see God seated on a throne, high and lifted up, far above all principality powers and everything on earth. And he looks down at the earth and whatever is going on, God is completely in control. He never stops, never stops working. And so you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be moved. All you and I have to do is go into our closets and say, Lord, whatever you want to reveal to me about this, let me know and show me how I'm supposed to respond because I'm really not worried what they're doing on the earthly level. I want to know what you're doing on the heavenly level. I want to know what you're doing on the heavenly level. Folks, this is not caught by God by surprise. I know that he's working. When Israel had a, when Egypt had a famine, it caused Israel to be moved so that they would be in another place. When, when Bethlehem had a famine, it caused Naomi and her husband to move to Moab to pick up Ruth. Whatever God is doing, know that it is working together for the good of the body of Christ and for the kingdom of God. Whatever he's doing, it's moving toward end time events. Whatever he's doing is moving toward the fulfillment, whether it's the death of Ahab or whether it's the birth or whether it's what moving people. Whatever he's doing, you can be perfectly at peace about this. He never stops. He never stops working. He is working on the planet. You don't have to be worried about the politics. Folks, we're not out of the fear factory yet. Because just we're moving into a into a season where the politics are going to get hot and heavy, and the flaming arrows are going to be shot from the left and from the right. They're going to be shot from every side, and you're going to see a lot of stuff going on in the next few months because a lot of people are afraid. The right is afraid that the the, the, the right is afraid that the left will prevail. The left is afraid that the right will prevail, and each of them believe that whichever one prevails is disastrous for the world. And so if it's, if it's Trump, it's disastrous from their point of view. If it's Biden, it's disastrous from the other side. So no matter which way you go, there are people who are terrified. Fear breeds anger. Anger breeds violence. You will be, it will not surprise me if you begin to see violence. The only thing I'm concerned about is the conservatives who have the guns. So <laughs> that's just a side note. We'll edit that out. <laughs> But whatever's going on, God is in control. So if we see some kind of collapse, if we see some kind of economic meltdown, if we see some kind of governmental overthrow, if we see some kind of craziness that we never would imagine, God is in control. Now let me finish up by going to the second level. That's the first level. From a macro, from a universal level, God is working. He never stops working. And I want to remind you as you read, especially as you read the Old Testament, that God is in control of world events. He sets one up and puts another down. There's not a king that's ever sat on any throne that's caught, by God, God, caught God by surprise or that God did not want them there. He says, I am the one who gives promotion. It comes from me. I'm the one who puts one up and puts another down. He can cause or allow pixie dust to be scattered over a nation and a nation become totally blind and vote in whomever. Whatever blindness that is, right or left. You see, I'm not really that into it because I have a kingdom perspective. Amen. So I'm not really worried about either one. It really doesn't matter to me either way. It doesn't matter, but, but I just trust God either way. Now, go with me. You're, you're very familiar. Go to Philippians. We're going to finish in the New Testament with a couple of passages of Scripture. Beginning flip, flip, I'm going to look at three passages of Scripture very quickly, and you know very quickly is a relative term. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Many of you already know it. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work, he's always working. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. We'll complete it under the day of Jesus Christ. He never stops. He never stops working on a universal level. He's working with kings and kingdoms and everything else. But in your life, he's still working. 
He uses your tears and your cheers. He uses your successes and your failures. He uses the great strengths of your personality and the great weaknesses of your personality. He uses all of that because he is working something for the kingdom's sake. He is, he is like a sculptor taking, the, taking his little chisel and working things in the clay and making whatever it is. And when he's done with it, he's going to look at it and say, that looks like Jesus. Because that's what he's doing with you to make you look like Jesus from your perspective, from, from all of the dynamics of what you are. And so he'll make you look like Jesus from you, and he'll make me look like Jesus from me. And so from me and from you and from everyone else, when we're all finished, he's going to look down and say, oh, I got me a whole house full of Jesuses. Look at their patience. Look at their love. Look at their joy. Look at their peace. Look at the character. They have different personalities. They have different humor. Some of them laugh. They have different singing styles, different song choices, different color, difference, different, different, different. But what they have in common is they love, they have joy, peace. All of that looks like Jesus. He never stops. He's begun a good work. Flip over, over chapter 2. Verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But here's the verse, verse 13. For it is God who works both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is at work. But what's he working? His pleasure. What's he working? Both to will and to do. He's working on your will. And he's working on your do. He's working. He never stops. He never stops. Even though you can't see it, he's working. Even though you can't feel it, he's working. He never stops. What's he doing? Working both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Are you praying to be a better prayer? Do you know why you want to be a better prayer? Because God is working in you the desire to be a better prayer because he can get you to start praying to pray so you can say, God, make me a better prayer. And God says, I keep those prayers in a bowl. And I'm looking at the bowl and I keep seeing this prayer of yours. Make me a better prayer. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make you a better prayer. Do you know why you're a better prayer? Because I put in your heart the desire to be a better prayer. I work in you both to will and to do. You want to evangelize? I'm the one who's working evangelism in you. You want to praise me? I'm the one who's working praise inside of you. Whatever he's put inside of you, he's working to bring it out of you. That's what God's doing. He never stops working. I know I'm yelling, but I haven't had to have people in the congregation for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Finish up Ephesians 2.10. Many of you know it. If you know Keith Green, it's a song. We are his workmanship, created for good works in Christ. Cause us to offer up ourselves a living sacrifice. Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship. He never stops, never stops working. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, God is working in you to do good works. Why? Because those good works bring glory to his name. Amen. We are his workmanship. Another word could be trophy. We are his trophy. A trophy doesn't bring glory to itself. A trophy reflects the, for the honor of someone else. If you have a trophy it, and it's, you, it's up on the shelf, people see the trophy and give you glory if it's your trophy. They give you glory for the trophy. The trophy doesn't get the glory. You get the glory for the trophy. So you're his trophy. You don't get the glory. He gets the glory. People look at you. If God has done something in your life that you've changed and that you have a testimony, and he's cleaned you up and he's filled you up and he's put a song in your heart or you write something or you minister to someone and somebody says, boy, you're just a great person. We just deflect that right to the glory of God. Say, no, if you'd have known what I was before he started working, uh, there would be nothing honorable about, about, honorable about me, but if there is any honor to be found, I praise God for that honor, but I give him all the glory because I am a trophy. I am his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. When you walk out of here today, I hope you walk out of here with the thought, he's still working. He's still working. He's still working. Through every failure, every, every success, every wrong, listen, can I finish up with this? 
your wrong moves are not wrong moves from a kingdom's perspective. They're wrong moves from a micro perspective, but from a macro perspective, God took Moses' wrong move and got him into the wilderness so that he could prepare him to be a deliverer. Moses made a big wrong move. Jacob's wrong move moved him toward kingdom destiny. Peter's wrong move. I don't know the man. Moved him toward his ministry. His wrong move moved him toward his ministry. I'm not saying go out and make wrong moves, but you're going to. And when you do, the enemy's going to come and say, you blew it, and now you're, you're no longer useful because you've done wrong and everything else. But if your faith will rise up to say, you know what? God will use even my wrong moves for kingdom's sake. So let me get on the right path. Let's, let's get on with this thing. Let's get on with this thing. The compassion he works in you is because you did things that were, you did things and you've seen people hurt and you may have even hurt them. And now you have compassion for the type of people you used to hurt. But you'd never have that compassion had God not been working in you. And your wrong moves move towards your good. He never stops working. So on a universal scale, you look at the world and everybody's got an opinion and kings and kingdoms will fall and the waves are roaring and the mountains are clapping and everything is shaking. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. And I've got a feeling in the next year, in the next few years, we're going to see some whole lot of shaking going on. But they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. It's then when we'll stand up like a Joseph in the midst of Egypt and say, Hey! For a season such as this, I was put here. Nobody's going to go hungry. Because I knew seven years ago this was going to happen. So we're ready. Or an Esther can stand up and say, Hey! Jews, you don't have to worry. God's got a Jewish queen sharing a bed with the king. Y'all are going to be all right. Send in Haman. My encouragement to you on YouTube and on Facebook, and we'd love to have you with us this morning, is this simple word. It's the title of the message. Even though I can't see it, he's working. And if you know the song, the next line is, even though I can't feel it, he's working. He never stops working. He never stops working. Guys on Facebook and on YouTube, we love you. We pray that you'd have a good day and that God would bless you.